Just this bit here. I think the projector connected. Okay, I saw. You see it? You can see it. The. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen. Nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasima kathira. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Um, and I hope everyone's looking forward to Ramadan, inshallah. And also the next stages of lockdown opening. So today we're going to we're going to speak about uh, the battle of of Ain Ain Jalut. And as um, as I normally do, as I normally like to do, I will start by reciting some verses of the Quran. Bismillah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما فصل طالوت بالجنود قال إن الله مبتليكم بنهر فمن شرب منه فليس مني ومن لم يطعمه فإنه مني إلا من اغترف غرفة بيده فشربوا منه إلا قليلا منهم فشربوا منه إلا قليلا منهم فلما جاوزه هو والذين آمنوا معه قالوا لا طاقة لنا اليوم بجانوت وجنوده قال الذين يظنون أنهم ملاق الله كم من فئة قليلة غلبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله والله مع الصابرين ولما برزوا جانوت وجنوده قالوا ربنا أفرغ علينا صبرا وثبت أقدامنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين فهزموهم بإذن الله وقتل داود جالوت وآتاه الله وآتاه الله الملك والحكمة وعلمه مما يشاء ولولا دفع الله الناس بعضهم ببعض لفسدت الأرض لفسدت الأرض ولكن الله ذو فضل على العالمين. So the verse I just recited are about uh, the are speaking uh, talk, talk, talk about the the conflict that occurred between. Uh, Talut and Jalut. So Talut was the was the king who was uh, chosen by the who was nominated by the by the Prophet of Allah to be king, and he was fighting against Jalut. And Jalut or Goliath, as we know, he was a tyrant, and he was he had a huge army. And as it says in the Quran, the the people who were on the side of Talut, many of them thought, how can we fight him? How can we? What what do we have? How how are we able to? Uh, go up against him. He's got such a big army. He's so strong. We're so small. But those who were those who were steadfast, as Allah says in the Quran, the, or those who were those who had faith in Allah, 
uh, they 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 had they had patience and they they said Allah is with those who have sabr. And in the end, as Allah says in the Quran, um, the, the, the the Jalut was defeated. Jalut was defeated by the smaller force, and and uh, he was killed. Goliath was killed by, uh, as we know, the Prophet Dawood or David, as they say. So now, this this uh, verse has some significance, or these verses have some significance for what we're going to speak about, because it's about the the smaller party, the smaller group. Overcoming the larger group when Allah, if if Allah, if if Allah wills, if Allah wills that to happen, it's about those who have those who have faith in Allah, those who have uh, patience, those who have uh, trust in Allah. They are able to, they were able to overcome the the larger group. And we'll see something similar when we come to the battle of Ain Jalut, which actually happened much, which is much later on, of course, many years later. Um, and it's it's a case of it's a case of the dog, so to speak, the people who were never expected to win. Everyone thought the Mongols would wipe them out. It's a case of them them winning in, in that case because they had they had trust in Allah. They 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 uh, obeyed Allah subhanahu wa taala. They had trust in Him. They 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 had they, they knew that Allah would help them, and Allah did help them, and they were able to in the end overcome the Mongol army, which was which was completely unheard of in that in that time. Now uh, also also there's some significance here as well because the the place where the battle occurred, Ain Jalut, is named after. Named off is it's 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 called or the springs of Goliath. It's it's the place. It's 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 said to be the place where, in fact, Dawood uh, killed killed Goliath, killed the 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 the, the tyrant who was who was uh, who was Goliath. So history history repeated itself over there in that that the, the smaller the smaller party, the ones who are not expected to win, but the ones who had trust in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and the ones who uh, were knew that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would help them, they they were able to come the, the overcome the bigger the bigger force. Okay. Now, the story of of the Mongols and how how they how they came how how this how how it, how it all started. It actually begins. We're going to begin. We're going to begin this story in in the plains of in the plains of uh, Mongolia, where there was no there was no no uh, cities, no civilization, no culture, nothing. Everyone was just living in these tribes, uh, Bedouin tribes, completely uncivilized. Nobody had any. There were no, 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 no cities or anything, anything built up there, and uh, it was very, very tough, of course. And people were brought up in a in a very, very rough manner, and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of a lot of evil stuff happened. You know, for one thing, for example, um, some women, some women would be seen by many different, many different men. So then, when they'd have a child, and now this this is in the this was in the Mong Mongol Mongol society at that time, basically Mongol tribes. Everyone's just living in the desert, and nobody nobody has any kind of um, religion, no civilization, nothing. So, the, for example, one of the things that, that would happen then is that that some a, a woman would be seen by many different men, and then she'd have some children, and she wouldn't know who the father is. Then again, I mean, I shouldn't probably shouldn't say shouldn't, shouldn't call the Mongols uncivilized for that because now now you see, I mean you see that happening now even in the, in the in, in some of the most Advanced countries, as they say, but that, that's 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 that that's something that was 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 very strange at that time, anyway. And uh, somewhere now, somewhere in somewhere in 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 somewhere within one of these tribes, there was uh, a woman, or in in some in a corner of one of these one of these plains, one of these valleys, completely away from from where all the other tribes were, where where everyone else was, uh, where everyone else lived. There was a woman who was who was abandoned uh, by. Well, they say it was the by 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 the by the the father. The woman was abandoned, and she was she was expecting a child. And uh, now we don't we don't uh, we don't really know we don't really know like uh, who the father was in that sense because the woman actually said when the child was when the child was born, the woman said that the rays of the sun, the rays of the sun, what gave me this child. So it's almost like. Like uh, as if she, maybe she, she read the she read maybe she knew about the story of the prophet the, 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 of Maryam alayhi salam and, and how um, the angel the, when the angel came to her and then she she was expecting it and then uh, she Allah subhanahu wa taala gave her a child without without any father there was no father but she was as it says in the Quran for she 
she she was uh, she became pregnant with the child. Uh, and, and, and told her that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is giving good news of a child. So maybe, who knows, maybe this, this Mong Mongolian woman, maybe she read that story and she said something similar here. But um, most likely what happened is, is, is the father just abandoned her and, and, and her family and, and, and left her. But anyway, she gave birth to this child, this child, and she named this child Temujin. Named the child, the child Temujin. And now this child had... This child had many um, brothers and sisters and, and, and so on. And they were living by themselves, just this, this small family, out, uh, completely out of the way from all the other Mongol tribes and, and, and everyone else. So already there was no, there's no civilization there, but then on top of that, these people were not even with, the, with, the, with everyone else, they were abandoned somewhere on the side. So they were just living by themselves. Life was very, very tough for them. So they had to uh, survive in that, in, that, in that climate. It was very, very difficult for them and just finding, finding places to stay, finding food to eat, all this stuff was very difficult. So much so that it's said that uh, this guy, Tem Temujin, he once um, killed his, so he only had two, only had two brothers. He, once kill, he killed one of his brothers uh, over a fish. They, 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 they caught a fish and then they were, they were arguing of who's gonna eat this fish because it's so, life is so difficult. He killed his brother for that. So that's, 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 that's how, how, how difficult the, the, the li life was for them over there in this, in this, uh, in this sort of abandoned place in, in somewhere, somewhere in, in, in Mongolia. Now what happened though, is that this guy called Temujin, he uh, was not going to, he was, he was, he was very tough. This, this, this sort of upbringing made him very, very, as, as you can see, he killed his own brother for a fish. Very ruthless, very and he actually had this had some sort of willpower that made him that that kept him it kept him going. And in fact, as he grew older and older, he uh, got more and more power over different different other Mongol Mongol tribes. He went and 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 um, interacted with them, and he slowly but surely he he worked his way up until he became the leader of um, different tribes. And eventually, he 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 got everyone to. He either fought, he fought some of them, he won some of them over with, with, his, with, with, his, with his words and so on. And, but eventually what happened is he united the whole Mongol, uh, the whole, the whole Mongol population at that time. Everyone there, he got them all under his control. So this guy, out of nowhere, abandoned in, in some corner somewhere with, with no, no, no father, just, just, his, just his mother and, 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 some brother, and uh, two of his brothers, no food, nothing. Somehow he survived all that. Somehow he survived all that. He went on to go and take control of all the Mongol tribes as well. So this was quite a, quite a big thing, even up to then. At that point, when he had control of everyone, all the Mongol tribes, what he did was he uh, decided he's going to, he decided he wants to take over the whole world. <clears throat> and, and, he, and he called himself, he gave himself the title Genghis Khan, you may have heard of. Uh, in, uh, Genghis, Genghis Khan basically means uh, the, the, king, the, 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 the emperor of the universe, the king of all kings, the emperor of, of everything. He took that title and he set his troops, he set his, he set his, uh, his, his people on the whole world. Now at this point, at this point, they, these, these, Mong, these Mongol people, they were very, you know, they were very, very well, uh, very well uh, trained in a sense that they, they, as I said, they had been brought up in a very rough life and they were very, very, uh, what's the word? They had a lot of resilience. They could fight very well. They could fight very well. They were not, not like um, people who were brought up in the city. They were brought up in a very rough life. So they were very tough. So these, these, Mongo, these Mongols, the, the soldiers, the Mongol soldiers became very difficult to beat. And they had many skills as well. For example, they could ride horses because they were brought up in the desert. They could ride, they were brought up in, you know, Bedouin tribes. They could ride horses uh, without, you know, without having to put that, having to, uh, usually when you ride a horse, you have to, you have to hold, the, the, hold, the, hold the reins properly. The Mongols, many of them could ride the horse without even putting their hands on the, on the reins. So now, of course, that's a big advantage because if you're, if, you're going, if, you're, if you're fighting in a war on a horse and you've got both your hands free, 
That's a big advantage if everyone else is, fi is, is fighting and they have to hold the, hold the reins of their horse with, with at least one hand. Very difficult to fight against. And this guy, Genghis Khan, he was very successful in, his, in building, his, building his empire at that time. Now, I want to go uh, back a little bit to speak about the whole, the whole picture of the Muslim world at the time and have a look at the whole, how the Muslim world had developed up, to, up until that point and sort of paint a picture for you in a sense because I want you to, I want you to get a feel for you know, where does this fit in? Where does Ain Jalut fit in? Where does you know, the Mongols coming out of nowhere, where does that, how does that fit into the whole, whole Muslim history? Um, so what we are going to do is we are going to go back a little to, because of course this guy, Genghis Khan, as you might know, he went on to, his, his armies went on to uh, take over a big percentage of the Muslim world. The Mongol, the Mongol, the Mongol armies, the Mongol empire, it, 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 it took a lot of other parts as well. So for, for example, even it got, got up to Europe eventually. But the Mongol empire, a big part of it was taken from the Muslims. So now the question is, the question is how is it possible that this guy can come out of the desert and there's so many Muslims at that time and just like that, so easily take it, take, take, take so many, so many of the Muslim lands from them just like that, so easily. Um, that, that, that's, that's, what, that's what I want to, that's what I want to have a look at now. Why, how, why did that happen? How did that happen? So I am going to go back a little. Okay. Um, yes, apologies. We, so uh, can you see the, can you see the, should be able to see it now. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So unfortunately we had a, we had a bit of an issue here because I couldn't connect the connecting. I had a bit of a problem connecting the projector, so I wasn't able to get it up on here. Um, but anyway, everyone watching live can probably see this. Maybe I would turn my laptop around if I could, but so the point, the point here is we've got, uh, so Mongolia, where is Mongolia? Mongolia is, is sort of above China and then far to the, far to the, far to the West, far to the left of that, there's all the Muslim lands, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, all these places. At the time, they weren't, they didn't have those names. They were just, they were just, you know, they were just, uh, they were, it was all one place, but these were all Muslim lands. So how did, how did, uh, what did the Mongols do to get, to get to the, 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 the Mongols, the Mongols didn't start by attacking Muslims. The Mongols started by, you know, they went to China and they went to all these other places in between. And then they eventually got to the, the Muslim lands. Now, sorry, second. Okay, so anyway, I want to talk about how, how, how the, the Muslim, Muslim world actually looked at that time. So looking at this, this map here, which again, yeah, sorry, sorry, yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, there's, so I've, 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 got, I've got this map here that, that you can see, maybe I'll turn this around. So anyway, maybe everyone can have a bit of a look here. We have the, so this, this, part, this, this part here in the, the darker part, that's, that's how, where Islam spread during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Islam spread to all this, this part here. And then this, this, this uh, lighter color here, the pink, is where Islam spread during the time of the, the four Khulafa. So, you know, you can see places like uh, Asham, Iraq. So Asham, where is Asham? Who knows where Asham is? Where is Asham? What is Asham now? Asham, Syria, Jordan, all those places, yeah? Okay, and then the places like Iraq and so on, all these places, Islam spread to all of these places. So during the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, during the time of uh, Uthman, and so on, maybe not so much during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because of, you know, there was certain, he was only, he was only uh, Khalifa for two years. But uh, during, during those times, the Islam, Islam spread quite far, as you can see. Okay, later on, Later on, Islam spread further. Islam spread to all these other places. So in the, the, um, the Umayyad Caliphate, during the Umayyad Caliphate, Islam spreads to all these places. And there are these, these parts here, like uh, in, the, in the east, very far east. So this, this, these, are all the, these are all the stans, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, all these places. These were all, uh, op Islam spread to all these places during the time of, during the, uh, the, time of the Umayyad people. The Umayyad people, the Banu Umayyad, they were the ones who came after 
the the Khulafa Rashidun. And during this, during so uh, the one the, the person, the, the, there's a very important person who, who went to went e went far east over here. This his name was Qutayba ibn Muslim. Qutayba ibn Muslim. He was was the one who spread Islam to all these parts. And then on the left, on the far left here, it, where, where what's all this? Can anyone see? Can, can anyone? I don't know if anyone. Can you guys see what what what? Oops. These countries here is all Algeria, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, all these places. Islam spread to these, these parts as well during the Umayyad time. Uh, it was someone called Uqba ibn Nafi'. Uqba ibn Nafi', he was one of the one of the important uh, Umayyad uh, um, generals or army commanders. He, Islam spread to this part during that time. And in fact, in fact, believe it or not, Islam even spread as far as Spain during the Umayyad Caliphate. So Islam was in Islam was actually in Europe. In, in Portugal and Spain. Now, who does anyone know who 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 led who led an army to Spain? Anyone know? No. Uh, Abd al-Rahman is al al uh, is um, Tariq bin Ziyad. Tariq bin Ziyad, yeah. You heard of Tariq bin Ziyad? Everyone's heard of Tariq bin Ziyad, right? Tariq bin Ziyad led an army all the way to so Islam spread all the way to all the way to Spain and and Portugal, and. Islam even spread to, believe it or not, Islam even spread to, down here, Islam spread to places like India. So Islam spread to India. Anyone know who, who, who went there? Who went to India? Yeah, Muhammad, Muhammad ibn al-Qasim al-Thaqafi. So anyway, Muhammad ibn al-Qasim, he's, he's another famous person, he went, to, he went to India. So as you can see, during the, during the Umayyad time, Islam spread to all these parts. Islam was spreading everywhere, and more and more people were, were, accepting, were accepting Islam. Um, okay, Just one second. Okay, now during during the during the the now it says it's they, we all we all call it. Uh, by the way, just a little point here. You know the the uh, does anyone does anyone know when the, when did the when this thing like we we say we say the caliphate? There's Omeya caliphate. There's caliphate. There's that caliphate. When did the caliphate actually end? When was when did the, when when was when was who was the last who was the last actual actual caliph? They don't know. Uh, you could say Umar ibn Abdulaziz, yes, to some extent. Uh, but in fact, the, the really the last the last actual last actual caliph was uh, was Ali ibn Abi Talib, anhu. In a sense, why is that? Because. Uh, the Khulafa al-Rashidun, so there's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Uthman, uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, right? They were all, so when, when, when we talk about the, the Khilafa, we say that uh, they, were all, they were all elected, right? The Muslims all elected them. The Muslims said, okay, we're going to, we, the Muslims uh, collectively elected them. After that, after that time, there was still this idea of the, of the, of the you know, there's some idea of, okay, there's a caliphate existing here, and uh, there's this um, there's Umayyad caliphate, Abbasid caliphate, all these caliphates. But what happened to it? It became inherited, right? It became inherited. It became so. It, so in, in a sense, it's actually like like a kingdom more than more than a caliphate. Because when, when you say when you say Khalifa, it, it should be someone who's elected by all the Muslims, not someone who inherits it because their father was because their father was king. Does that make sense? So anyway, that's that's just a little point here because people often people often talk about uh, revive, you know, bring coming back to the caliphate and stuff like that. The point here is actually. The, the real the, the, the proper caliphate actually ended you know really ended 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 uh, you know a few years uh, 40 30 years after the after the the prophet Islam passed away because after that it was actually more like a kingdom and no doubt these people did do good things umayyad Abbasid, all these people but uh, but it was actually more like a kingdom so i you know i prefer to call him king and by the way with with when it comes because when it comes to when it comes to the 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 four khulafa how did how would they all like how did they all become become caliphs how would they all like so with Abu Bakr anhu how did how did Abu Bakr become become the caliph anybody how did Abu Bakr become the caliph uh, yeah you could say that in the sense that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that he should lead the prayer before the Prophet ﷺ passed away and afterwards but the point is here all the Muslims. All the Muslims agreed, yeah? All the Muslims accepted. We are going to appoint Abu Bakr. Okay, when Umar radiallahu anhu became Khalifa, how did he become Khalifa? So uh, when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was passing away, uh, he told the Muslim people, you appoint someone. 
You appoint someone. So the Muslim people all you know, thought, and then they went back to Abu Bakr and they said, no, we don't know who to appoint, you choose for us. And Abu Bakr said, what do you think of Umar? What do you think of Umar? And then they said, you know, uh, they, they, approved, they, they also agreed. So, but the point here is all the Muslims agreed, right? The Muslims, now all the, I'm not saying, I'm saying all the, all the people, the, 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 Every, 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 little, every, every, every single person, but you know, the people who are consulted, the people who need to be consult, consulted, they all agreed. They all agreed, and with reason as well, that Umar should be, the, should be appointed the, the Khalifa. Okay, and after that, Uthman, how was he appointed? Anyone know? So with Uthman, he was appointed because uh, Umar, when he was, what happened to Umar, by the way? Does anyone know? What happened to Umar? Yeah, he, he was he was stabbed by the by a by a man who uh, was, you know a fire worshiper. He he came during the prayer and he he stabbed him. So Umar, when he was passing away, he he said he appointed a committee of six people. He appointed a committee of six people to choose the next next caliph. And they were they were six of the most important uh, Sahaba. They were you know can anyone tell me who do you think he chose? He chose six people. Who who do you think he chose? So, of course, Uthman and Ali, and then four of the others as well. So, uh, Zubayr Talha, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, and uh, Saad ibn Umi Waqas. These, these are the four, four important people. What happened is basically uh, three of them, three of them stepped down, so then only three are left Uthman, Ali, and, and Abdurrahman ibn Awf. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf said he doesn't want it. So he's, so which of you two wants to step down? Neither of them want, both uh, Ali radiallahu anhu and, and Uthman saw themselves as, as appropriate to be, uh, to be uh, Khalifa. So neither of them stepped down. So then Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu had to choose between them. So now you might think, okay, nice. Now, now, he's, now he's got the, the, the fun task of choosing who's going to be the next caliph. But actually it wasn't like that. Abdurrahman ibn Awf, for three, so for three days now, for three days, he's got the, he's got the, the, uh, he's, he's got to choose who's going to be killed within three days between Uthman and Ali. And he said that for three days, he didn't sleep. He didn't sleep. He was just going around all, all, all around Medina and everywhere, speaking to every single person, speaking to everyone among the Muslims, you know, all those who are older, of course, and asking them, what's your opinion? What do you think? Who's, who's more appropriate, Uthman or, Uthman or, uh, or, um, or Ali? And, what, and what's your reasoning? And eventually, you know, all the Muslims agreed that Uthman is more, most of the Muslims agreed that Uthman is more appropriate, so Uthman radiallahu anhu was, was chosen. And again, afterwards, when Uthman radiallahu anhu passed away, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu was picked by all the Muslims. The point being, during this, during this, uh, the, the, when it came to the, the, the al-Khilafa al-Rashid, the, 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 the caliphate, the Islamic caliphate, all the caliphs, all the four caliphs were picked. How? They were picked because the Muslims, the Muslims all over, everywhere agreed that the Muslims appointed this person for the, because he, because, so, because such and such, he's the most appropriate person to be the, to be the caliph. After that, after that, it became kingship, right? It became more like a kingdom. And in fact, there's, there's a, there's a hadith on this as well. that basically says that the, that the, the caliphate on, um, on the, the al khilafa ala min hajin nubuwa, the caliphate on the, the, the way of the prophet, is, is 30 years. Now, 30 years after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, it included, if, you, if, if people count, when people counted, it included Abu Bakr's time, included Umar's time, included Uthman's time, Ali's time, and also uh, Al-Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu anhu. So all these, all these five. Afterwards, in the hadith, it says that afterwards it becomes, you know, a, a king, king, kingship. So basically, that's what it became afterwards. Not that I'm saying that anything wrong with that, but the point here is, um, Everyone should understand, you know, historically, how did all these things work? Because this is going to become important. This is going to become very important when it comes to the Mongol time. And you know, what's happening, what's happening at that time? Because by then, there are all these people wanting to be king. Everyone wants to be king. So now everyone, at that point, everyone was, everyone was fighting each other. And there were, you know, there were big problems. That's why, that's how the, the, the Mongols were able to, uh, were able to uh, win so easily. So anyway, the... the this, this. Okay. So then, late, later on, 
Now this is just again I'm giving because I'm trying to, I'm trying to go through you know the the history before that so that you have an understanding of at the at the time of the Mongols how was it how was it like that later on the uh, people from the people from from the from the family of uh, Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib radhiyallahu anhu who's the uncle of the Prophet sallam descendants of his son Abdullah ibn Abbas who's heard of Abdullah ibn Abbas everyone anyone heard of Abdullah ibn Abbas yeah he's a famous companion he's a cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. They started this idea because the, the Banu Umayyad, the Umayyad people, who well, as I said, they were kings, they, they benefited the Muslims, no doubt, but they were also, they, 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 gave, they benefited the Muslims a lot. They also, they also had their problems though, they were oppressive, they were, they were, they were taking wealth um, wrongly and so on. And they, they, they were, there were many problems during the time of Banu Umayyad. They weren't perfect. They, but during, so the, 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 people, the descendants of, of, of uh, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, what they did is they started calling towards everyone. They said everyone should come to pledge allegiance, allegiance to to who to to uh, to someone from the family of the Prophet They said these people, Banu Maya, were fed up with them. They do this and they do that. They kill everyone. They take everyone's money. They're doing all these bad things. Everyone come and pledge allegiance to. The descendant of the prophet, the, the 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 someone from the family of the prophet, and they didn't say who it was. So many people thought at that time. Many people thought at that time that actually this guy is going to be from the from the family of the prophet. He's going to be a descendant of the prophet. Some people thought he's going to be the he's going to be Imam Jafar al Sadiq, who's uh, you know people the he's regarded as the, the sixth Imam of the, the for the Shia people. But anyway, he was he was Jafar al Sadiq was you know he was he was a great Imam. Although he was a great he was a great scholar. Although we of course we don't say that he was. Uh, Imam in that sense, but he was a great scholar. So people thought, people thought that that is going to be one of these people, one of the descendants of the Prophet, one of the descendants of the Prophet. But these these uh, people from the from uh, the the descendants of Ibn Abbas radhiAllahu anhu is the cousin of the Prophet, and he's still close to the Prophet. Remember, he's still closer to the Prophet than the Umayyad people. Umayyad people are far away. Umayyad people are from Quraysh, but they're not really so much related to the Prophet. They somehow got into power and then began their long line of Long line of king, long line of uh, of, of their, their their kingdom, their long line of kings. So now these people from ban, the the Banu uh, Abbas, they got this things, got this. Uh, they basically started this call towards everyone pledging allegiance to some imam. They said this imam from the family of the prophet, and they started this. Where did they start it? So just go back to my. They started this in. In, uh, in a place called Khurasan. So Khurasan, now the Umayyad Caliphate, Caliphate, the Umayyad, Umayyad, Umayyad Kingdom was in basically Asham. It was located, the, the, the capital was in Asham. So now where are they ruling? They're ruling up to Spain in the, in the west and up to, uh, you know, Iran and stuff in the east. Such a, it's such a large, large, uh, large kingdom. Islamic kingdom, but the, 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 the capital was in, was in Asham, it was in Syria. So the Abbasid people, the, the descendants of Ibn Abbas, they sent someone to Khurasan. Khurasan, where is Khurasan? Khurasan is very far away, as far away as possible from, from the um, uh, Umayyads, from where the Umayyads are. And they, and they started this thing, this call towards pledging allegiance to, um, to, uh, uh, the, the imam, the imam from the imam from the family of the prophet. Now the point, the point being again, the reason why I keep going on, I'm going through all of this is because I want to give you an idea when we get to the Mongol time, how everything was divided and why people were all fighting. The, the, they start, they, they were calling towards, they were calling towards uh, pledging allegiance to, to this this imam. So what happened is, the the Khurasan gradually it 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 they they, they pledged they, everyone started pledging allegiance to to uh, to him in secret. And eventually, the guy they sent, his name was uh, Abu Muslim Al Khurasani. Very, very, um, not not very not very well looked at in history. He, he did a lot of bad stuff. This guy, he took over the whole of Khurasan. Took over the whole of the whole of Khurasan, and he went on to start taking parts of Iraq as well. So all Iran and all of that. And then, in the year 132 after after Hijra, how many years after Hijra? 132 after Hijra. So it's a uh, it's been a long time since the, the Prophet ﷺ passed away. It's been a long time. It's been about 90 years since the beginning of this Umayyad thing, the, 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 the line of Umayyads. 
in the year 132, the, this person called uh, uh, as Safah, Abu al-Abbas as Safah, he declared himself the Caliph in Kufa. Where is Kufa? In Iraq, yeah? Kufa was very important at that time. Why, why, can anyone tell me, why is Kufa going to be a very important place in that sense, geographically? It's right in the center, isn't it? You know, there's Iraq, then you've got Khurasan and all these places on the east, then to the left, you've got Asham and all of this. Down south, what's down south? Arabia, yeah? Makkah and Medina, all these places down south. It's right in the center. This guy, Abu al-Abbas al safah he declared himself the Caliph in Kufa. And they did a big, 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 uh, they, 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 and he sent, he sent his, uh, he sent his uncle, he sent his uncle, Abdullah ibn Ali, he sent his uncle to go and fight the, the Umayyads, go and fight the Umayyads. And the last Umayyad, the last Umayyad king was, his name was Marwan, Marwan ibn Muhammad. He sent his uncle, Abdullah ibn Ali, to go and fight him. And there was a big war over there, and Abdullah ibn Ali won, and he became the new uh, he was appointed the new governor of, 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 uh, of Asham, so Syria and all that region. And now the Abbasid Caliph, the, Abba, the Abbasid, Abbasids have taken over from, from, the, from the Umayyads. And they set up their, 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 their capital in, in Iraq. But the, the, this guy, Abdullah ibn Ali, he, he was the governor of, of Asham. Now, what did he do? He began to uh, wipe out every single Umayyad person who was, who was there. Every single Umayyad person who was there, he had them all killed. So, for example, one time he invited hundreds of Umayyad, Umayyad people. They're all from the Banu Umayyah. He invited all of them to a, a big banquet, big party. And then uh, midway through, he closed all the doors and he had all of them beaten to death. This guy, Abdullah ibn Ali. Uh, he's the uncle of, uncle of the first uh, Abbasid king or Abbasid caliph. And the point, the point here is, this is wounds. This, this happens when it, when it comes to power and all this stuff and, and, fight, and you know, fighting between people, rebellion. This is what, this is what tends, to, tends to always, always happen. You know, the, the, there'll be some sort of, when there's a rebellion, pe loads of people end up dying. And now this, this guy, he basically... He's ethnically cleansing, in a sense. Anyone who's got any Umayyad, any Umayyad links at all, he had them all killed. All of them were killed, except one guy, Abdurrahman ibn Muawiyah, who escaped to uh, Spain, and then he set up his own kingdom there. He revived the, the um, Umayyad, Umayyad kingdom there. But the this guy killed everyone. What did the Arabs do at this point also? They also began to get rid of everyone who took part in the revolution with them, who was...
they were they they they, they, they there's big big battle everyone's so many people are killed he was killed and so many you know the, the point is now what what's happening when when people start doing all these revolutions and stuff everyone's fighting against each other the result is always it always seems to be the same big disaster so many people are killed um, and uh, it, it tends to be bad for the Muslims. Now, again, again, what happened is, again, what happened is later on, yeah, no, I didn't. Go back three or four minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's okay now. So anyway, what I was talking about is the the uh, the Abbasid, basically Abbasid revolution, the Abbasid revolution, and how they how they overthrew the Umayyad people. And the point is, the point is with the Abbasids, what did they do? They uh, they revolted because they said that the uh, they said they said that the Umayyads were so oppressive. In the process, what happened? Many Muslim people died. And the point is, I'm, tr I'm trying to make the point as well because it's reflect to, so that we can learn from this today also. You know, we can see all these revolutions and stuff happening in the Muslim world. What's, what's, the, what's the result? You know, often it's, it's for a good cause, but what happens? Many Muslim people die. That's, that really is what, what ends up happening. Now, again, as I said, this guy, Abdullah ibn Ali, he led the, he led the, the revolution, he, or he led the, 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 the battle against Umayyad. He, he was the uncle of, of the first Abbasid Caliph, as Safa. And what did he do? When uh, as Safah died, he handed over to his brother Al-Mansur. So what did Abdullah ibn Ali do? He became very annoyed. He said, I should be the one. So what did he do? He rebelled against Al-Mansur. And he said, I'm going to get rid of him. I'm going to be the next one. So Al-Mansur called this guy, Abu Muslim from Khurasan, and he said, go and fight my uncle. So Abu Muslim beat his uncle, um, and then he had his uncle, he had his uncle killed, basically. He put him in a house and then made the house fall on top of him. And then... Abu Muslim also became too powerful and it seemed like he was also going to start a revolt from Khurasan. So what did Al-Mansur do? He had him also killed. The point is now so many people, everyone's revolting. End result, those Muslims are, are killed. This is what happens when, when there's so much, so much disunity. Again, afterwards what happened is one of the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he also rebelled because he said that, you know, the Abbasid people are too oppressive and uh, taking money from people and not, 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 not ruling by the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and oppressing everybody. What did he do? He rebelled against the Abbasid people. What happened to him? He was killed along with many of his family. And who, who are his family? His family are the descendants of the Prophet So we can see this was, this was again a disaster. It was so bad, in fact, it was so bad that once what happened is, after all of this, Somebody else in Khurasan, Far East, he rebelled. He said, I've had enough of these Abbasid people, Al-Mansur, I'm going to rebel. So he got a big army to rebel. So what did uh, the, K the King Al-Mansur, what did he do? He sent, he sent, some he sent, he sent a, big, a big force to go and fight this rebellion. So these people went to fight the rebellion and they crushed the rebellion. And then the leader of that force that was sent to get rid of the rebellion, what did he do? He said he's rebelling against Al-Mansur as well because he wanted more power himself and he saw that he was very powerful. So he also, he also rebelled against Al-Mansur. He also decided to rebel against Al-Mansur. In the end, for some reason, he died along the way. So then that was, that was safe. Otherwise that would have been what? Tens of thousands more Muslims killed. Again, the point I'm trying to make is I'm going through all of this. I'm showing you what happened over history with, with, these, with these revolutions and stuff. People are fighting each other. Everyone wants the power. In the end, what happens? So many Muslim, you could say Muslim civilians are killed. And what are we seeing today? Same thing, exact same thing. Everyone wants the power, and no doubt, you know, even in some of the some of the some of the protests and stuff that we see today, they're, they're call, calling for something good. You know, they're saying, you know, these people are oppressive. You know, let's call towards call towards, you know, let's 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 get rid of these oppressive people and let's 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 live by you know the commands of Allah and so on. And this is this is no doubt good. But the problem is, in the middle of all that, what happens? Muslim people, so many Muslim people are killed, and in fact. It's as, as it, it happened in the time of uh, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Who's heard of Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf? Yeah, you heard of Al-Hajjaj, right? Very oppressive guy. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, a thaqafi he sent, so now this is back during the time of the Umayyads. Sorry, we're jumping back and forth here. He is back during the time of the Umayyads. Al-Hajjaj, he sent an army to 
uh, with he said he had he had this guy called Abdul Rahman ibn al ibn al Ashath. Abdul Rahman ibn al Ashath. He is a famous uh, he was a famous general, very very capable. He sent him to fight some people in the Far East. What did this guy do? After fighting a little bit, he decided to stop. He's going to stop there. And then uh, Al-Hajjaj said, no, 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 don't stop. Keep going. He got upset with Al-Hajjaj. He got angry with Al-Hajjaj. And he decided to rebel against Al-Hajjaj. He decided to turn against Al-Hajjaj. And he spoke to all the people and he said, you know, Al-Hajjaj is a zalim, he's a very bad person. And Al-Hajjaj, no, no. He killed hundreds of, he killed, you know, tens of thousands of people. Al-Hajjaj, even from the companions, he was known to be oppressive. So he called everyone and he said, I'm going to rebel against Al-Hajjaj. And what did they have? This army, it was a big army, big army sent to fight people in the East. This guy, he had, they say he had 150,000 strong army or something like that. And this guy also, Ibn al-Ash'ath, he also got people of the people of the, the of knowledge as well. Some of the big scholars, he got them as well. They also joined his army. They also joined his army. Because they were thinking, you know, let's get rid of this oppressive guy. Let's get rid of this, 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 this guy and, and, you know, it will be all better. The problem is, imagine you're thinking now, this guy's got 150,000 strong army. Al-Hajjaj and all the other people also have 100,000 more. What's going to happen? What's going to happen, right? So this guy, Ibn al-Ash'ath, they told him, if you want to really win this war and you want everyone to be standing with you and not giving up no matter what, go and get Al-Hassan al-Basri. Al-Hassan al-Basri. Has anyone heard of Al-Hassan al-Basri? Now, go and get him. Go and get him and get him to join, get him to join your, your army. So they went to Al-Hassan al-Basri and they were fully convinced he'll go because Al-Hassan al-Basri also was known to be condemning Al-Hajjaj for all his, all, his, uh, all his oppression. So they went to him and they said to him, Come and join us. And let's go and fight Al-Hajjaj. Let's go and get rid of this guy. So Al-Hassan al-Basri refused to take part. He refused to take part. He said, if Al-Hajjaj is a punishment from Allah upon you, if, if Al-Hajjaj is a punishment of Allah, you're not going to remove the punishment of Allah with your swords. And if Al-Hajjaj is a test, a trial of Allah upon, for you, then be patient. But as for you want me to come and get involved in this thing where you go with your hundreds of more over 100,000 people, Al-Hajjaj has hundred, more than 100,000 people, and we all fight each other? No, I'm not getting in involved in that. This is what Al-Hassan al-Basri said. Not that, he, not that he didn't think Al-Hajjaj was bad. He knew Al-Hajjaj was very bad. Not that he didn't think that... But the thing is, it's not like now these people are disbelievers and these people are Muslims. These people are all Muslims, but the leader is a bit oppressive. And on this side, you have more Muslims, and then the guy wants to overthrow him. So he said, no, I'm not getting involved. So what happened in the end? They fought each other. Al-Hajjaj won. Ibn al-Ash'ath, Abdul Rahman ibn al-Ash'ath, al it said that when he lost, he actually said that when he lost, he threw himself off a cliff. I don't know if this, 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 this is what this one, one possibility. Or they killed him. Either way, Ibn al-Ash'ath, his army lost. And what happened? All Al-Hajjaj now, he started killing everyone from that, from that side. Or he'd say to them, he'd say to them, Either you declare publicly to everyone that you have, been a, you have disbelieved in Allah. You, were, you did kufr. Why did you do kufr? Because you went against me. I'm the, I'm the, you, know, I'm the, the, you went against me and Amir al-Mu'mineen, he called you know, the Umayyad Caliph. Umayyad al-Hajjaj was working for the Umayyad Caliph. You went against us. This is equivalent to disbelief. Either you declare to everyone that you've done kufr. You disbelieved in Allah or, or I'll kill you. So you're doing that to everyone. And many people, some people even declared that they were disbelieving in Allah uh, they, because they, to save, that, save themselves. Uh, that they had disbelieved in Allah and then now, they, now they've been guided back. One guy he brought is an old man who was with Ibn al-Ash'ath. He said to him, you either declare that you, dis you did kufr when you, when you went against us or I'll kill you. The guy said, I worshipped Allah for 80 years continuously. And now you want me to? Now, 80 years, imagine that, 80 years you've been worshipping Allah and now you want me to say I disbelieved? How, how bad that would be and you refused to, so Al-Hajjaj killed him. So the point is, you can see here, this is what, what did they think at the beginning? Al-Hajjaj is a bad guy, he's oppressive and so on. We are, you know, we've got so many, so, so, much, so much, such a big army, let's go and fight him and let's get rid of him. Get rid of this oppressive guy and start ruling by the command of Allah. What happened in the end? Such a bad, such a bad result, so many Muslims were killed, hundreds of thousands of Muslims were killed. And... Even, you know, big scholars as well. Sa'id ibn Jubair, famous scholar. He was also killed. Al-Hajjaj killed him. And it said that he made a dua. Oh Allah, make, make me the last person Al-Hajjaj kills. 
and after Al-Hajjaj killed him, Al-Hajjaj also died. The point is here, rebellion, revolution, all this stuff. So, since the time of, uh, since the time when the, 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 the people rebelled against Uthman radiallahu anhu entered his, uh, entered his house and killed him, Uthman ibn Uthman radiallahu anhu, you've all heard of Uthman, the caliph, he was killed by rebels. They entered his house and they killed him. Since that time, there have been thousands of revolutions. 99% of the time, 99% of the time, it's been, it's, it's, the, the results have been catastrophic. And now we can see, you know, in the Muslim world now, what's happening? Everyone's fighting against everyone, so many revolutions. And in the, in the middle of all of it, what's happening? So many Muslim people are, so many Muslim people are dying. Now, anyway, I've gone quite long, gone quite long painting this picture, but let's just, let's just quickly do this. So anyway, the Abbasid Caliphate, it went on for a while. After this, there's the golden age of the, the Abbasid Caliphate. You know, so many uh, uh, in Baghdad, the Bayt al Hikmah was established, you know, the House of Wisdom, so many books. Al Khawarizmi, has anyone heard of Al Khawarizmi? He's, 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 uh, he's the one who they say he invented algebra. Say he invented algebra. Al Khawarizmi, his book was published in, 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 uh, in Baghdad. Um, and, you know, so much, so much knowledge is, is, is being spread. So this, this, at this time, it was flourishing. Later on, even the Abbasid Caliphate, it became a bit weak. It became a bit weak or the Abbasid Kingdom, I should say. They, they became a bit weak, and now things started splitting up. So already, you know, that already, you know in, in uh, Spain, there's someone else ruling. Then, you know, gradually, people start popping up everywhere. You know, there's, there's the Fatimids, there's this, there's the, there's this person, this, this kingdom, that kingdom. Kingdoms popping up everywhere. And many of these, king, many of these kingdoms actually were loyal to the Abbasids. They said, we're ruling for the Abbasids. And they would say, they would say that, that Abbasid guy is the caliph, but we're, we're, just, we're just the kings, and, and they would make dua for him in their khutbah as well. They say, oh Allah, you know, this is the, the Abbas here. They make special dua for him. But these kingdoms, they would fight against each other. Each one wants to expand. You know, imagine how's the, what, 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 how bad the Muslim world would be if, if there were, you know, 10 different kingdoms and everyone's fighting each other, right? That, 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 was, that was a big problem then. So these, uh, these different kingdoms... Sorry, let's check... Okay, these, these, these different kingdoms were all, as I said, fighting against each other, and gradually the Abbasid part became smaller and smaller, and it's just that, just, just a small bit there, and there are all these different kingdoms around, the Khawarizm kingdom, the, the Ayyubid, the, this, this and that, so many different kingdoms, and everyone's fighting each other. Often, this is the worst part, often, so now they wouldn't, they wouldn't try to fight the Abbasids, of course, they'd say Abbasids are, you know, they're, they're the caliphs, but they would fight, fight each other to expand their territory. Often, they would get non-Muslims to come and fight as well. For example, Crusaders, they say, you know, can you come and help us? We'll fight, fight, these, uh, fight these, these other people. We want to expand our territory. So this, is, this was the big problem of the Muslim Ummah. I've spent the last quite a bit, quite a bit of time just, just, just painting the picture of you, showing you why this was such a big, big problem at the time. Why, why the Muslims were so weak? Because everyone's fighting against each other. Everyone wants to be powerful. Everyone wants to be the most, the most, uh, the one with the most land and the most followers and the most money and so on. So, so much disunity. What happened now, coming all the way back to Genghis Khan, he was coming from, as I said, from, you know, from the East, from Mongolia. The, the king, the kingdom, the, the empire there at the time in the East, nearest to him with all the stands, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, all these places was the Khawarizm kingdom, the Khawarizm kingdom. So what happened is Genghis Khan, he was fighting China and all these places expanding everywhere. And it said that he would send spies and stuff. So he sent, there were these, Mong, there were these Mongol businessmen who were in the, in the kingdom of, somewhere within the kingdom of Khawarizm in one of the cities, they entered this, one of the cities. And what happened is they uh, were caught by the governor. The governor caught them and killed them. The governor caught them and killed them. So Genghis Khan wrote to the, the leader, the, the Sultan or whatever of the Khawarizm Empire, and he said, either you hand over this governor to us for me to deal with him because he's killed our people, or we'll fight you. The governor didn't look at it as a big threat. He's saying, who's this guy? Some Mongol guy from, from nowhere. You know, what, what, who cares about him? He refused. So what did Genghis Khan do? He declared war on them. And within barely any time at all, he wiped out this whole Khawarizm kingdom. And this is, this is a huge area. All, the, all, all these, all these parts. It's as, as it's, uh, they, they, they say basically. This, it's, it's uh, behind the, behind the. What's the river called? The River Tigris? No, not the River Tigris. There's another river. 
Anyway, that, that, that whole area, that whole area, the, the Mongols got all that part. So now, what's going to happen next? They, the Mongols at this point, what did they do in all these cities as well? So I'm just going to read out to you what, uh, how, they would, uh, how they would do it. They were, you know, they were going, going around burning all the big cities, Samarkand, Bukhara, Herat, all these places, they were burning all these big cities down to the ground, killing everyone. No, no, they wouldn't leave, they wouldn't leave anybody. It said that they would even, you know, they would do, you know, what, you know, what uh, people do, people do with women, they did all of that, dishonored all the women. Uh, they would even, it said they would even, when there would be someone, there would be someone who's pregnant, they would even, what would they do? They would, they would kill the woman, remove the fetus and kill the fetus as well. This is how they were. And they, they basically, in all these cities, they built towers of skulls. They built skull towers, Bukhara, all these big places. And you know, Bukhara, what's, what, who, who knows, any, what, does anyone know anything about Bukhara? What's significant about Bukhara? Imam al-Bukhari, exactly. It's a big, big city of knowledge and everything. This was, a, again, a catastrophe. They, they wiped out everyone there, burnt it down to the ground. <clears throat> okay, and what did, what did this guy, Genghis Khan, what did he do? He said, he said to the people, I am the punishment of Allah on you. I am the punishment of Allah sent to you. If you hadn't committed so many great sins, Allah won't have sent me against you. So again, you can see, he, 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 knew, he, knew what he, was, he knew what he was doing, this Genghis Khan guy. So it seemed at that point like he's going to have the whole world, right? It seemed like he's going to be able to spread to the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole he's, taken, he's taken already China and so many different places. It seemed like he's going to spread a lot further. But then, in the year 624 AH, so uh, it's like 12th, 13th century, he died. Genghis Khan died. So then the, then the, whole, the whole spread of the, the Mongols stopped, stopped a bit. And there was a bit of internal fighting until eventually his son, Ogaday, he took over. Ogaday took over. And do people know about him? And what happened? Then later on, Okay, in, six, in, in, in 648 AH, one of, the, one of Genghis Khan's uh, grandchildren, so when did, when did Genghis Khan die? He died in 624. So 624, between 624 and 648, there was some internal struggle for the Mongols. And you can see again, the Mongols, when they had their own internal fighting, what happened? They were disunited. When they were disunited, what happened? They weren't able to keep going and taking all the Muslim, all the Muslim lands and stuff. But then what happened is in 648 AH, one of uh, Genghis Khan's son, uh, grandsons, uh, Mong, so his name is Mon Monke Khan, Monke Khan or Monge Khan. He decided to continue his grandfather's ambition to conquer the whole world. What did he do? Yeah. His name is Monge, Monge Khan, Monge Khan. So all the Khans, the, all the big kings. What did he do? He decided to continue his grandfather's ambition to conquer the whole world. So he sent his brother, his brother Hulagu, Hulagu Khan. Has anyone heard of Hulagu? Yeah, Hulagu. He sent his brother Hulagu Khan to carry on the conquest westwards. What is westwards? All of the Muslim lands, Asham, um, Egypt, Iraq, all these places. So Hulagu carried on. Um, and sorry, one moment. Okay, now by this time, for this Abbasid Caliphate, only Baghdad was left. And now, how long are we since the Abbasid Caliphate started or kingdom? 500 years. 500 years ago, it started. It's been going through ups and downs, and they've lost a bit of land and stuff, but they were more, by and large, they were considered the Islamic Caliphate in the world at the time. Most people respected them. Even though they were different kingdoms, as I said, Ayyubid, all these other different things, they all respected the Abbasid people. They said, this is the Caliph. By that time, they basically just had Baghdad in Iraq and what's around it. So what did Hulagu do? Hulagu sent, uh, sorry. Okay, so now the last Caliph or King, the last Abbasid, what did he do? He could have fought them properly. He could have fought the, the, um, the Abbasids properly and not, 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 you know, not surrender because he knows what happened to other cities, Bukhara, Samarkand, all these places. He knows how badly they were, they were, they were destroyed. But this, this last Caliph, his name is Al-Musta'asim, Al-Musta'asim Billah. Al-Musta'asim Billah, the last, he's the 37th. So you can imagine how much time has passed now. 500 years ago, the Abbasid thing started. 
He's the 37th of them, five, about 500 years later. Al Musta'asim Billah, he uh, was, you know, he was a man of a man of this world, basically. He was enjoying all the pleasures and stuff, having all the money and you know, all the all the all the big respect and everything. And also, so he was basically enjoying himself. And also, on top of that, there were some internal divisions. So for, somehow the head vizier, you know, this is the caliph, this is the big caliphate and everything, the head vizier actually disliked the caliph and he wanted the Muslims not to fight and he wanted them to surrender. So what happened is basically he was, he was you know, he was, he's basically a traitor. So what happened is even those who wanted to prepare an army to fight the Mongols, you know, the Mongols are coming. What have they done in Bukhara? What have they done in Samarkand? What have they done in all these places? They're going to basically destroy us now. So some people wanted to, wanted to fight them, to prepare an army to fight them. There's no other option. We have to defend ourselves. This guy, the head vizier, he delayed that option. He delayed those people. He, he put them off. He was putting them off, so there was a, there was a preparation weren't properly made. You know, to prepare for a big war like this against the Mongols, you have to prepare properly. This, the, the Muslims weren't able to prepare themselves properly. Eventually, they did send out about 20,000 people to fight. And I mean, that may sound like a lot, but, you know, 20,000 20, 20, people may sound, may sound like a big army, but, you know, this is Baghdad. This is Baghdad. This is the big place. This is the center of the whole Islamic world. This is, you know, where all the knowledge is, where all the... Uh, scholarship has been where all the all the Muslim where all the Muslims you know where, where the, the caliphate has been for the last 500 years it's very important very important place big and, and very populated place as well over a million people inhabited Baghdad at the time so to send out an army of 20,000 to fight Hulagu was ridiculous and they were easily beaten Hulagu easily beat them okay so at this point the, the Al Mustasim, he tried to negotiate sometimes. He tried to negotiate with Hulagu. You know, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll, we'll give in a bit to you. But Hulagu did not, Hulagu refused to accept. Eventually, after a 13 day siege, so Baghdad has been sieged for 13 days. In about in 658, 656 AH, after the Hijrah, so it's 1258, mid 13th century, the, the city surrendered. The city surrendered. They say that when the city surrendered and when the Mongols entered, the caliph was drinking wine in his palace, watching women uh, dance and sing. Right? This is this is what this is what it had become. We, you know, we might wonder. As I said, the Mongols come from out of nowhere. They come in within such a short space of time. They sweep through the whole Muslim world. How did it happen? How? What? Like, what? 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 What was the cause behind it? Because the Muslims were all like like this, all fighting each other. And when it comes to actually defending themselves against the Mongols and stuff. Nobody's serious. So uh, now for, for days and days, the Mongols remained just killing people. They were just, just killing everyone. Uh, people, people would just be queuing up. People were just lying in queues waiting to be killed. And it said that the river Tigris is the river that, that goes through uh, Al Iraq. It turned red because of all the blood. You know, they're killing so many people throwing all the bodies in the, in the river. Imagine that, a whole river, is, it's not like a small, a small stream, it's a big river. It turned red because of all the blood. And on top of that, on top of that, you know, as we said, Baghdad is a center of learning, center of, center of all this knowledge. There's the Bayt al-Baytul al-Hikmah, all this. Everyone, you know, in the past, this, this is the point we often miss. In the past, people from Europe and elsewhere, in this, during this time, they would all learn Arabic. Many, you know, European philosophers, they would learn Arabic to be able to access all the knowledge from Baghdad and places like that, right? Now, of course, it's the other way around. But back then, Arabic was so important because all the knowledge, you want to study science, you have to learn Arabic. You want to study um, uh, philosophy, anything you need to learn Arabic. All the Westerners, they were all learning Arabic because of all the knowledge in the Muslim world. And primarily Baghdad. Baghdad is the center of all of it. And Baghdad is where the Bayt al-Hikmah is. What did the Mongols do? So now they've already turned the river, what color? Red. They took all the books from the Bayt al Hikmah and they threw them in the river. So now the river turned black. So there was the, the, the river Nom is what? Well, we say water is transparent, but you know, it's a big body of water, it's blue. The river turned red and then turned black. That's how bad, that's how bad the, the, this, this was. And as you know, it really is the greatest, one of the greatest calamities in the history of the, in the, history of the Muslim world, the, the, the destruction of Baghdad. Um, 
Ibn al Athir, he's the famous historian, he writes that uh, basically he says, uh, I've, I've, For many years, I've just refused to even talk about this, this disaster. Baghdad is so bad, he refused to even talk about it because of how great it was, how bad it was, how evil it was, how much he disliked it. And he says, You know, I stepped towards it with one foot, thinking I'll speak about it. And then with the other, with the one leg, I step to take one step towards it to speak about it. What happened in Baghdad? Then, I, then with my other leg, I step backwards. Basically, he's saying, I'm sort of back and forth, thinking, shall I speak about it? Shall I not? But I, I, every time I want to speak about it, I can't because it's so bad. Baghdad, it was a complete, complete disaster, catastrophe. And it said, they say that the estimates are between 800,000 and 2 million people. Between 800,000 and 2 million people were killed in Baghdad in the in the fall of Baghdad. Imagine, now, maybe that might not seem like, before, 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 you know, at that point, how much was the human population anyway, right? Human population isn't that large for, for two, two, up to between 800,000 and 2 million people to be killed in one, within the space of a few days. Human population was not that large anyway back then. And this is all before, you know, before WMD and so on, weapons of mass destruction. It said in history, I don't know whether it's true or not, it said before nuclear bombs and all this, the, four, the, the number of people who were killed in the siege of Baghdad was the largest ever, largest ever. Nowhere else had, had, anyone, had any people been killed in such a short, had such a large number of people been killed in such a short space of time. Okay, after the, after the fall of Baghdad, I mean, the Mongols basically became invincible. People just gave up. People thought this is the sign of the end of time. People thought the Mongols are the Yajuj and Majuj, people who come at the end of time and you know, there'll be so, so large number. People thought they are them. And people had just given up. They said the Mongols can't be fought. The people were ex basically, it's like people were expecting to wake up one day and the sun will uh, rise in the West. People thought that's it, it's the end of time. These Mongols, we can't do anything about them. They'll kill everyone. And they are, you know, they're, they're a sign of the, 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 the day of judgment. And it said even, the Mong uh, there'd be a Mongol person, he'd be, he'd be standing in front of a group of people, he'd say to them, just wait here, I'll go back to my, go back to my house, I get my sword and come back and kill you. And the people won't do anything, they just wait there. And the Mongol guy, he'd go back to his house, get his sword, come back and, and kill the people. Um, so after this, city just, just kept on falling. You know, Damascus, um, uh, Aleppo, all these big cities, all the major cities, and everywhere around them, all these regions, Asham, Iraq, all of that, it's all falling. Um, I actually, Asham though, with all these, with many of these cities, what did they do? The Mongols would give the people an agreement. They'd say, you can peacefully surrender and leave the city. Peacefully surrender and then leave the city. Okay, what happened once the people surrendered and opened the doors? What would the Mongols do? They killed everybody. They didn't leave anybody. In fact, I, I, it, it was so bad that um, you know, I remember someone was, uh, I remember one, I was, some, some, there was an, uh, someone was uh, talking about this uh, and he was saying, in a sense, these Mongols were so, were, so, were so destructive, even worse than, in a sense, even worse than a Dajjal, because he was saying a Dajjal, when he comes, a Dajjal will kill those who disagree with him and leave those who agree with him. Those who give him to him, he'll leave them. The Mongols didn't leave anyone. The people surrender, peacefully supposed to leave. Mongols slaughtered everyone. Women, men, children, babies, unborn, kill everyone. Everyone was, everyone was wiped out. So as I said, what? Treacherous as well. They said you can leave and then they, they destroyed them all. Okay. Uh, now, what's, what's, what's gone? Iraq has gone. Obviously, Khorasan and all that Iran part has gone. Asham now has also fallen. Palestine, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, all of that's gone. What's left? Anyone tell me what's left? Only, you know, only, only basically the only powerful part that's left is Egypt. That's the only power that's left. Interestingly enough though, Hulagu has now wiped out all the, all the Islamic, all every, because if you look on the map, it's like basically you've got Asham and down below, what's there down below? Al Hijaz, you know, the, where Makkah and Medina and now modern day, what they call Saudi Arabia, Makkah and Medina and all these places, right? And, and, and not, not Saudi Arabia, but also, you know, the, um, Qatar, um, UAE, uh, 
Kuwait, all these parts, right? Where Mecca and Medina is. Hulagu has wiped out everyone. Asham, all of that. All the power is gone. All the armies are gone. All the kingdoms are gone. There's nothing to stop him going down and destroying Makkah and Medina. There's no people. No people can stop him from doing that. But subhanAllah, it's amazing. He, he didn't, he, he, either it didn't, the thought didn't come to his mind or maybe it came to his mind and he just decided against it. It's almost, it's, it's almost like when they, when they look at it, it's almost like a miracle, if you think about it. It's a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Makkah and Medina. This guy has destroyed everyone. No armies left, no kingdoms left, nothing. No power left. No human power left. He could easily have gone down. He could have walked down. Nobody would have stopped him. Gone, gone down to Mecca, Medina and all these places. Nobody, no, no human could have gone in his way. But he, it's, it seems like he didn't even think of it. It didn't even occur to him. To go to Mecca and Medina and destroy these places. He destroyed everywhere. He destroyed Bukhara, Samarkand, all these big places. Mecca and Medina, just, the thought just didn't come to his mind. And subhanAllah, we see here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was protecting Mecca and Medina. Just like, you know, when, whenever anyone has tried to do anything to it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected it. In this case, he didn't even attempt it. Hulagu didn't bother. He just couldn't be bothered. He just, now what, what's left to him? Misr, Egypt. Okay. Um, now, so far, he's been beating everyone who, everyone who got in his way. He, he encountered the Abbasid, he encountered the Khawarizm people, he encountered everyone. The only people among the Muslim, Muslim kingdoms who were able to stop them were the Mamluks. Mamluks. And who are the Mamluks? The Mamluks are from, they were actually slaves. Mamluks were slaves. Mamluk people were slaves from uh, the Turkic, Turkic regions. When I say Turkic, I mean what's behind uh, Khurasan and so on. All, all that area is, you know, the, all the stands. I don't mean, mean modern-day Turkey. I mean that, that area there. Although maybe those people in Turkey, Turkey now is also from that area, but the point is that area there. And there's actually, now the Mongols are also from there. The Mongols are also from there. So the, the Mamluks, the Mongols, as I said, they were very tough people, very rough. It seemed like nobody could beat them. These Mamluks were also, in fact, from that region. And it's, 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 um, you know, it's, it's worth mentioning that these people actually were known to be very good for fighting. And there's a, there's, a, there's a narration that goes back to the Prophet, although it may be quite weak. It said that, it, I'm, I, it's, not, it's definitely not in, in the authentic books of Hadith, but basically it says, uh, Leave the Turks. Leave the Turks as long as they leave you. Don't fight. Basically, don't fight them because they're very tough people, very rough people, very difficult to fight against these types of people. So as you can see, the Mongols are from there. The Mamluks people, people, are, people are also from there. So whether this is authentic or not, it has, there's, a, there's a point here that, you know, those people from that region, they were known to be very good, very good fighters. So the Mamluks, they were from there, but they were taken as slaves. They were basically slaves and they were in different parts, Syria, um, you know, Iraq, and also in Egypt. There were many of these people in Egypt. And now they came to prominence when, uh, when during the time of one of the, one of the kings, his name is a descendant of uh, Salah al-Din, his name is al-Salih Ayyub. When he was fighting the Crusaders, this is not Salah al-Din, this is one of his descendants. When he was fighting the Crusaders, the Mamluks came into prominence. They became very important. Um, and as I said, very good fighters, very well trained and so on. If he, they had such a high position that this guy's son, Salih Ayyub, his son, he thought they're too powerful. And what do, they, what do people do when they, when they think someone's too powerful? They try to get rid of them, right? So they, he tried to kill, get rid of all these Mamluk people. They're, as I said, they're slaves, right? So they're, so they're not expected to rule. Slaves want, slaves want rulers, right? The, the, but they, 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 just, they just rose in the ranks because they were good fighters, well-organized, well-trained, became army commanders and so on. And they're fighting against who? The Crusaders. So what, what happened? They basically got rid of Turan Shah, who's the, who's the son of As-Salih Ayyub. As-Salih Ayyub, his son was Turan Shah. He basically tried to get rid of the Mamluks because he thought they're too powerful. And then they got rid of him. So now, at this point, this is when, the, or around this point, this is when you know, the news is coming. The, the, the Mongols have got rid of, uh, wiped out uh, Baghdad and so on, and they're coming for Egypt. And Egypt is the last standing place. So the, uh, the, there were now, now, now four, some, some, some many important, a few important Mamluks. So there was, there was Qutuz, Saifuddin Qutuz, then Ruknuddin Baybars, Baybars, very important. 
uh, and there's someone else called called uh, Aqtai, and then and also Aybak. Basically, of these, one of them he became the he became the ruler now. After this guy, after this last Ayyubid guy was gone, one of these became the ruler. Aybak he became the ruler. Eventually, after he died. They were going after he died. They were going to, and he's, he made he made Qutuz, Saif al Din Qutuz, He made him his vice, vice vice sultan, you could say, vice king, or vice president. He made him he made him his vice. So uh, when he died, there was a twelve his, his son, basically ten year old or twelve year old or something. He was put on the throne, son of this guy called Aybak. And now in all this in all this this you know chaos. There's a 10 year old on the throne, the, the Mongols are coming for you. They've just wiped out basically what? All the Muslim world, basically, except they haven't, they haven't, bothered, they haven't, they haven't, haven't bothered to go down to places like Makkah and Medina. They've just wiped out everywhere else. And now they're coming for Egypt. Egypt's the last stand, basically. Egypt's the last stand uh, before, for, in, in the face of, in the, face of the, the, the Mongols. So what happened? Uh, the, the scholar at that time, the big scholar at that time, his name is Al-Aiz ibn Abd salam Al-Aiz ibn Abd salam he said that this is not the time for a 10-year-old to be in charge, right? He said, Qutuz, you, you should be in charge. So he, he, he nominated that, that Qutuz, this guy called Qutuz, Saif al-Din Qutuz. He's one of the Mamluks. Again, they're all Mamluks. They're all brought as slaves, but now they've risen, risen up in the ranks and become basically become powerful, become important. He said, this guy, you, sh you should be in charge. So Qutuz was given, uh, was made in charge. And this uh, Al-Aiz ibn Abd salam he also gave a fatwa saying that everyone, everyone should uh, give, contribute something towards preparing the army, because this is it. This is it. After this, if we, if we are beaten, basically Islam is finished. There's no more, everyone, where, where the Muslims are going to be wiped out of the face of the earth. He said everyone should contribute something to, to preparing the army. So you know, everyone, farm, all, all, all the people, all the all the all the population of, of Egypt, they all contributed some money or something or whatever, buying weapons and so on to preparing the army. Um, and now, my small detail here: this guy called uh, Bibars, him and Kupos had something, some problem between them because Kupos and and the other guy, Aybak, had basically been on one side and, and uh, Aqtai and, and Bibars had been on the other side and Aqtai had been killed. So Bibars' friend, Bibars' friend had been killed basically. Bibars', Bibars leader had been killed, his, 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 you could say his mentor, his most, one, one, of his big, one of his best friends, he was killed. And on the other side, we got Aybak and Qutu. So Bibars had run away. Now at this point, this is it. The Mongols are coming. They're going to Either this, either we beat them now, or or or, or that, or that's it. No, no one's going to stand in their way again. They're going to wipe all the Muslims off the face of the earth. Bibas came back, and he made peace with Qutuz. They, they made they made a peace agreement between them, and they agreed to fight the Mongols together. Now Hulagu sent a letter to Qutuz, and the letter is full of threats. That is full of full of threats, basically saying, you know, you, you don't stand any chance in the face of us. I wiped everyone out. I've done this and this and this and this in the cities. The amazing thing is what he also says in these. Did uh, something happen? To okay. What he also says in these is he actually mentions some verses of Quran as well. For example, he says, These people, the Mongols, they were actually quoting verses of the Quran whenever they'd write to these Muslim leaders, quoting verses of the Quran, showing them where they've gone wrong. They say, you know, you've done this and done this and this and this and this. And it says in your book here in the Quran, it says this. And you're clearly differing with that. You're clearly, you're clearly not, not, not following your own Quran. And he said in the letter, Hulagu also said, you guys are the ones who have uh, disobeyed the command of Allah. You, you're eating from haram. You're doing this. You're doing that. You're doing this. Allah has sent us against you and we're going to destroy you. And it was full of threats. And he said, we're going, we're going to wipe you out. You don't stand a chance. So Qutuz now, him, he's, there's him, there's Baibars, and there's other people. They're, you know, conferring, what are we going to do? What do we do? Some of the people said, let's make peace with him. Let's make peace with him. Does that sound like a good idea, anyone? What did he do before when, when people made peace with him? He slaughtered everyone. Everyone was killed. They, right? So Baibars, he said, no. He said, I say, 
We grab these messengers who brought his threatening letter and we kill them and we, and we kill them and we, and we display their bodies in the city you know, in, 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 uh, in Cairo, in, in Al Qahira. We display their bodies in the city. And that's actually, they, they, actually, they actually did do that. Now, a little point here. Messengers, should, messengers are not allowed to be killed. University messengers are not allowed to be killed. Everyone, everyone, everyone knows that, right? So we agreed upon thing. Nobody kills messengers. So really, from an is Islamically, he shouldn't really have done this. Then again, though, Hulagu, after all, he, his people are the ones who betrayed the whole city, right? Damascus, Aleppo, all these places, they did treachery over there. They, they, gave, they gave the word and then they killed the whole city. Now this is just a few messengers. Even so, I mean, you know, Islamically, we don't, in Islam, we don't really say, you know, tit for tat or something. So you can't really excuse it, but that's, that's, that's what he did. That's what Qusuz did. Um, and you can see that the, there's a reason why, because people now, when they're seeing the messengers and they know this is it, we've killed the messengers, this is it now. There's no turning back. We can't now say, ah, oh, can we make peace? Can, you, can we surrender or something? We've killed the messengers, that's it. We either fight for it or we all die. This is Egypt now. As I've said, what, what's happened? The Mongols have taken everywhere else. They've come up to this point. There's just Egypt left. He said, now, 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 they, now you've killed the messengers as well. That's, that's, the, that's basically the last, last drugs. Now all the people united, all the people were very excited now to be fighting the Mongols. Everyone's very enthusiastic. Everyone's, everyone's all for it. The Muslims are going around saying, you know, this is the last, the last, they're encouraging each other saying, we are the last people standing. You know, on the, on the, and they were, make, they were all making dua to Allah. Oh, Allah, help us. We are the last people. We are, we are, this is it. This is it. Now, if the Mongols beat us, that's it. Muslims are going to be wiped off the face of the earth. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ actually made a dua in, in uh, the Battle of Badr. Prophet ﷺ was praying all night. And he made a dua saying, Oh, Allah, we are the last people. We, we are the only people who are worshipping you on the face of the earth now. So if we are beaten, this is in Badr, if we are beaten, you, you will not be worshipped after this. No one will be there to worship you after this. This is what the Prophet ﷺ made this dua before the Battle of Badr. These people now are making a similar dua. Similar dua. Battle of Badr happened when? Ramadan. This is also going to happen in Ramadan. They're making this dua now. Everyone's united. This is the important thing. Everyone is united. Everyone is putting their trust in Allah. Everyone is uh, taking the right steps. Everyone is preparing. They're all, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's fighting each other at this point. So what happened is, as I said, they killed the messengers. This went back to, uh, and they sent, he sent, Qutbah sent a letter back to Hulagu, uh, you know, saying, replying, you know, basically replying to all his threats and, and, and saying, you know, we're going to beat you and stuff like this. Basically, he sent a very nice letter. The, the letters are, you know, I, I had a look at them today. Hulagu, his letter was basically page, over, over a page long and full of so many, so many things, verses of the Quran and, and so on. So obviously I can't read all that. And again, Qutbah sent, sent a suitable reply. Basically he sent a very, very brave reply, very bold reply saying, no, we are going to stand up to you. We are going to beat you. That's basically the message he gave, that, he gave to Hulagu. Now at this point, Hulagu was in, uh, as I said, he's in basically the, in, in and around Iraq and, and Asham. And where are these people? They're in Mosul. What happened is, as I said, what did I say? I said, all the Muslims at this point, they're all turning to Allah, they're all united, they're all making dua, they're all putting their in Allah. What happened is at this point, who did I say the, ki the king was? Uh, you, one, I think one of you asked me, one of you asked me what his name is. Monge Khan, right? Monge Khan, or the, the, the Mongol Empire, the, the Mongol Empire, em 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 Emperor, sorry. He died, at this point he died. So what did Hulagu do? Now, at this point, there are his two brothers, uh, Kublai Khan and one other one. And Hulagu knew that they're going to possibly start, there's possibly going to be a big uh, battle or fight over who becomes the next emperor. Because of course the Mongol, Mongol em Empire at this time is huge. So of course everyone's going to want to be the emperor. So Mong Ke Khan has died. Hulagu knew that now his two brothers are going to fight over it. Hulagu himself knew he wasn't really a claimant to it. He couldn't really get it himself. But his two brothers are going to fight over it, Kublai and one other one. So Hulagu decided to go back to the, the, their capital, go back to Mongolia. And he took with him 30,000 of the soldiers. At that time, they had about 50,000 50, soldiers. So how many did he leave behind? About 20,000. About 20,000 soldiers. Hulagu took 30,000 back. And subhanAllah, it's amazing, you can see. The Muslims are all united at this point, and they're all ready to fight, fight, the, fight them, united, not fighting each other. Very soon afterwards, what happens? The Mongols 
their 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 plans got messed up because what? Because their because their their leader died and they were all disunited. The Muslims became united and, and very soon afterwards the Mongols had a big problem because they were all disunited because their leader died and now their their the two two brothers are fighting over it. So Hulagu had to go back. So now there's only twenty thousand left under the command of uh Ketbuga Noyan, that's the name. Or, or we say uh, um, yeah. Katbaga or something. There's so many, so many different ways his name is said. Let's say Katbaga. Katbaga Nuyan. Well, that sounds too Arabic. Let's say Katbaga Nuyan. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be an Arabic name. He also, by the way, was the one who did this thing with Damascus. He said, you can all go. They opened the doors. He came in and killed them all. This guy, Katbaga Nuyan, he was left with about 20,000 soldiers. So now Qutuz, he marched out of, out of uh, Egypt towards Ain Jalut. Where is Ain Jalut? Ain Jalut is in modern day Palestine. Qutuz marched out towards Ain Jalut with about uh, 14,000 soldiers. About 14,000 soldiers. Um, and as I said, the, the Mongols were about, about 20,000, let's say, 20,000. The, 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 the <clears throat> they also, at this point, they made some peace agreements with some of the, uh, there, were, there were some <clears throat> uh, Christian fortresses along the way, blocking the way. So they had to make peace agreements with them. So they did, they did that. The Christians agreed. They, they, didn't, they, they, didn't, they, they didn't agree to fight the Muslims, fight alongside the Muslims against the Mongols, but they at least said, you can go through to get to the Mongols without us doing anything. We're not going to do anything. Because of course, at this point, you know, you can't fight everyone. You can't fight the Crusaders and Mongols and all, all at the same time. <clears throat> so they, they were able to get, get to get to Ain Jalut. Now it was a tactically chosen, tactic, tactically, tactically chosen place. Why were you going to fight in um, in Ain Jalut? They say it said that it was actually Baybars who, who chose this plot. Why did he choose Ain Jalut? Because have a look at it here. Basically. <clears throat> Everyone can see this. Ain Jalut, it's all, there's, there's all, this is all the green part is hilly. All the green part is, there are lots of, lots of, lots of hills and stuff, mountains around it. There's this one opening at the front. So Baibars chose this part. Why did he choose this place? Or well, Baibars suggested to Qutuz. Why did he choose this place? Because he knew that he wanted to get the, get the army surrounded. He wanted to get the army trapped, surrounded from, from, from all sides. He knew that. Uh, this is, when an army is surrounded, they, they, they can't fight as well. Actually, this is well, this is well known. I mean, all, you know, many, of the, many of the very significant battles in history were, were won like this by, by an army. Because however big the army is, even if the army is massive, if it's surrounded from all sides, it's very difficult for them to fight. Even if the ones surrounding them are, are, are fewer, right? Even if there's, say, 10,000 soldiers, but they're all surrounded on all sides by 2,000 soldiers, it's much more difficult for the ones who are surrounded to fight because anyway, uh, like, you, like if, you're, if, you, if you're surrounded, your, your, your soldiers become, some of your soldiers become useless as well. You may have a big number, but it, it, it's very difficult for you to fight. So by bars, he knew this. He knew this, so what was his plan? To get them into Ain Jalut, to get them trapped over here. But how's he gonna do that? Because this guy, uh, Kat Baha, he is a very experienced guy, and he was in fact a, 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 a one of uh, Genghis Khan's generals. So now he's now he's now he's, he's he's serving for Genghis Khan's grandson Hulagu, but he was one of Genghis Khan's generals. He's a very experienced guy. Is he really going to walk into a trap like that? So what did Baibars do? And now remember how how many how many are the Mongols? There are about twenty thousand. Baibars, his plan <coughs> was he. Uh, so so Kupus, Kupus, Hid the, hid the Muslims in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mountains and, and hills surrounding, surrounding, this, the, the, surrounding Ain Jalut. So the, the Muslims were hidden in all these different places and Qutuz was with them. And Baibars, he led 1,000 people or maybe less to go and to charge the whole Mongol army. Imagine that now, there's about 20,000 of them. With under 1,000 people, he charged the whole Mongol army and he, he charged into them, killed, killed a few of them and then retreated. And then, they started shooting arrows at the Mongols and then charged again and retreated. And then charged again and retreated. Every time 
the Mongols would come closer and closer to them. So they, 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 they basically, they, they charge the Mongols, then they go back, the Mongols come take a step towards them. Then they attack again, go back, the Mongols come towards them. And now, of course, this requires some courage, right? I mean, no, who's going to, with only a few hundred people, charge at a whole 20,000 strong army? This, is, this sounds like something crazy, but this was what, you know, Baybars uh, did. He was known for, for being a very, you know, very brave, uh, very brave leader. And what did he do? He succeeded in getting the Mongols into, into Ain Jalut, into this part here. The Mongols, he got the Mongols up to here, the whole army. And at that point, that's when Kopos ordered the, the Muslims to attack from the sides. Ordered the Muslims to attack from the sides. The Muslims all attack from the sides. And now the Mongols are realizing, oh, it's a bit of a trap, but they can't, it's difficult also for them to turn around and, and run back. Why, why can't they turn around? Because if you turn your back on, on the enemy, when they're attacking you from the front and from the sides, this will be very dangerous, right? You're likely to lose lots of people. So they can't really turn around. So Katsbuga, he's stuck in here, attacked from all sides, and he doesn't want to turn around and turn around and go back either. So what can he do? So what he ordered his, his people to do is to concentrate on the on the right. He said, he said, attack the people on the right. All of you focus on this part on the right here. This spot looks a bit weak. Focus on this part here. And climb the climb the hills and whatever over there and attack them. So now the Muslims are attacking from all sides, and the Mongol army has has has, has fallen into it. He said, attack them. So the Mongols started pushing pressing this, this part here, and they were succeeding. They were succeeding. They were, they were actually getting, getting, uh, pushing the Muslims back, pushing the Muslims back and, and driving a hole. They were penetrating a hole in the Muslim, in the Muslim, Muslim ranks of that. So what did Qutuz do? Qutuz went and went and uh, joined them, went, went, went to join them over there and he, he took his helmet off and he shouted, Wa Islama, Wa Islama, basically means, you know, for Islam, you know, for the sake of, the sake of Islam, save Islam. So, when the, when the soldiers saw that the, the leader is there with them, and they can all see he's there with them to fight as well, they became extra motivated and they actually pushed back on the Mongols and they, they, they fight, started fighting with you know, new, new, renew, like renewed uh, resolve and pushed the Mongols back. So now the Mongols got pushed back down. At the same time, Baibars, he managed to basically go around the side and, and he started pushing the Muslims. So now the Mongols are all in here, right? The Mongols are all in this part. The Muslims are pushing around the sides. So now what? The Mongols are there. Muslims in front of them. Muslims on the right. Muslims on the left. And now at the back as well, they're starting to close around. So they're almost completely surrounded. Almost completely surrounded. So at this point, the Mongols start getting slaughtered. The Mongols start getting beaten so badly. Some of them tried to retreat, and some of them were able to retreat through that gap, through the small gap. But it was very difficult. The Mongols were basically completely surrounded from all sides and they were getting sorted. The Mongols were getting, were getting uh, killed very badly. Ketbuga at that point, he realized, okay, that's it, the battle is basically lost. Ketbuga just took, uh, left his bodyguards and, and joined the fight himself and Ketbuga was killed also. And after that, what happened? The Muslims won a resounding, a resounding victory. And most of the, imagine that, 20,000 soldier, Mongol soldiers, most of them didn't survive this. Very few of them actually managed to get back out from there. It basically became what? Surrounded from all sides. Mongols, basically, most of them, most of them died. So, this, I mean, if this, if this, if this, this, this when this, when this happened, everyone was shocked. It was completely unexpected. And by the way, Qutuz, you know, when, when, when this happened, you know, he went and prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he, he, he thanked Allah for, for giving this, this victory. And all the Muslims were very grateful to Allah. And they all, uh, all turned to Allah and thanked Allah for, for blessing them with this, this victory. Now, uh, yeah, as I said, this was on 25th of Ramadan as well, so it's extra special. And we should bear this in mind when Ramadan comes up because, you know, historically Ramadan has been very, you know, Muslims have been very active. You know, Badr happened, this happened, this happened. It's not the time for sitting around. You know, it's not the time to be lazy. It's, it's the time to actually do as much good, as many good deeds as we can, not, not uh, sit back. Uh, and actually, now after this, Baibars, Baibars also was sent on a small expedition against uh, Hulagu's son. Hulagu sent his son with uh, some, some soldiers. Baibars was sent against him. Baibars captured uh, Hulagu's son and sent his head back to Hulagu. So you can see how the tables have turned now, right? Hulagu, all this time, he's been create, well, him and his grandfather and all of them, they've been creating skull towers in all the big Muslim cities. 
800,000 to 2 million people were killed in Baghdad. Think about that. Now, you can see how the tables have kind of turned. And as I said, Baybars, he sent, he sent, uh, he, he captured uh, Hulagu's son and he sent his head back to um, Hulagu. Uh, now, the, sorry. Okay, unfortunately, unfortunately, on the way back to Egypt, and by the way, this was, this was such a big victory, this, the news spread so much everywhere, and Muslims in all cities now were so inspired to, to, to fight back against the Mongols. So now Syria, Iraq, all these places, the Muslims started fighting back, and many places were won back. Damascus, all these places were won back, because now people are, pe people, the spell on people's minds was broken. As I said before, it was almost like the Mongols are invincible. You know, when there's some, there's, you know, we can't beat these people, impossible. They are... The, 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 is this the end of time? Now, the news comes, the Muslims beat them in Ain Jalut. The Muslims beat them in Ain Jalut, not just beat them, they basically killed almost all of Hulagu's army. Almost all of them died in Ain Jalut. The Muslims were all inspired. Now, now, now they started you know, fighting back in all the different cities. Okay, what happened is... Okay. Um, on, unfortunately, on the way back, on the way back, uh, the the to to Egypt, Qutuz was assassinated. Qutuz was killed on the way back to e Egypt. Qutuz was killed. Uh, now they say now there are different different stories that, that say you know who killed him and what. Some people say it was Baybars and his revenge for uh, Qutuz being involved in his friend being killed. Uh, we don't really know what happened. Is uh, Baybars became became Baybars became Sultan. I mean Baybars became the Sultan after Qutuz. Uh, but you know Qutuz, you know he may have Qutuz was killed him, but the legacy he left lived on forever. This battle is, you know, one of the greatest, one of the greatest days in the history of, history of Islam. And after that, as I said, all these other cities also were inspired after that. And after this, the Mongols fought the, Mus the, the Mamluks about four more times. And they lost at least three of them. So imagine that, right? Until now, the Mongols haven't been beaten by anyone. Not in the Muslim world, not in the non-Muslim world, not in the Christian world, nowhere. Now, Suddenly the Mongols lose this big lose this battle. And after this, they lose three more battles as well against the against the against the Mamluks. Okay. Um, and, and then you know what happened? The Mongols started to convert to Islam. Later on, the Mongols started to convert to Islam. And as you as some of you might know, the, has anyone heard of the Mughals? The Mughals of India, right? The Mughals of India were descended from, from, the, from the Mongols. The Mongols of India. They were, you know, they were big, they were the ruling India for a long time. Um, I think between the 15th century and and after uh, until no, I can't, I can't remember exactly. But even even you know Taj Mahal. Who's heard of Taj Mahal? Yeah, big big building in India. Some say it's the best building in the whole world, or the most good-looking building in the whole world. They say it was built by a, a Mughal emperor who's a emperor who's a descendant of the Mongols who converted to Islam. And one of the big people, Burke Khan, who's another grandson of, of Hulagu, he converted to Islam at that time. So now all of a sudden the Mongols are all converting to Islam. And you know, we see that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives kingdom to whoever he wills. So Allah says in the Quran, Qul malika al-mulk, al-mulka man tasha, wa tanzi'u al-mulka man tasha. To Allah belongs, oh, 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 oh Allah, the, 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 the king of all kingdoms, malik al-mulk, tu'ti al-mulka man tasha. You give, the, you give kingdom to whoever you will. You know, all these people throughout history, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, everyone, people have come and gone. And you take, you take away the kingdom from whoever you want. It's your, Allah is the one who gives. Allah is the one who chooses. Allah is the one who gives. And as we say, Subhana man la yazalu mulku. Subhana man la yazalu mulku. Glory be to Allah. Allah is perfect. Allah's kingdom never, never dies. The Mongols, Genghis Khan, he had this, he had this vision in, 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 the, in, the, in the desert to rule the whole world. Within a few hundred years, he built the biggest kingdom, the second big, he built a kingdom that spanned all the way from, you know, Mongolia and, and other parts east to Poland, to Poland. 9.2 square, 9 square kilometers, 9.2 square kilometers, uh, 9.2 million square kilometers. It's the second largest kingdom in history. Second largest kingdom in history, larger, even larger than any of the Muslim, you know, any Umayyad, Abbasid, Rashid, second largest kingdom in history. Only, you know, the British Empire was geographically was larger, but, but, but uh, the, Mongol, the Mongol kingdom was, was by far, was, was, you know, massive, 
Now today, can we see any trace of them? No trace of the Mongols, right? Disappeared completely. As we read in the Quran, Allah, Allah gives kingdom to whoever wishes and he takes from whoever, whoever he wishes. Um, and really the biggest lesson we need to learn from all of this, the biggest lesson we learn from all of this is that united we stand and divided we fall. This is a very important, very important point to, to, to learn. When people unite, that's when, when the Muslims unite, that's when Muslims are successful. When the Muslims disunite and are fighting within each other and even calling other people to come and help them fight other Muslims, what can we expect? That's when all the Muslims were, were destroyed so badly. Uh, and really, that's, that's pretty much it. I've come to the end of, of that. Does anyone have any questions or anything? Any questions here? Huh? No. 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 Um, no. no questions? Start. start the Kahoot? Okay, we'll start the <coughs> Kahoot. Just remember there's a delay, I think. Yeah. So it doesn't matter the delay. Uh, it does, but I guess everyone has the same disadvantage. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Bismillah. Um, yeah, yeah, you join, everyone joins. Let me send it to you. Uh, the big question, who was ruling the Hijaz area when, uh, when, when these, these things were happening? That's a good question. Who was ruling the Hijaz area? Uh, Hijaz area was basically uh, under the control of, a, of, a, of some tribes. Under the control of some tribes. There were some tribes who, had, who, were, who, were, who basically independently... When we, say, when we say Hijaz area, I'm talking about excluding Makkah and Medina. So you know Makkah and Medina, there's a strip. Makkah and there's Medina on the left, sort of towards the left. Makkah and Medina are very much towards the, the west of, you know, modern day Saudi Arabia, right? And then there's all the, all the, all of, uh, all the rest on the right. The, all of that is, is, is um, there are other stuff there, but Makkah and Medina is far to the left. That part was ruled by, uh, they say the Abbasids and then also the, the Seljuks, the Seljuk Turks also had some, some saying that at, at some point, and the Ayyubids. The rest of Al-Hijaz, it's almost like nobody could be bothered. It's almost like nobody could be bothered to, to take that part because, uh, you know, a lot of that part is, is uninhabited. You know, there's Najd and there's Tihama and there's all these parts. So many of these parts were, were, just, were just left to some Arab tribes. Some, some, some different Arab tribes were, were ruling. And they did actually make some, they did actually establish some, some kingdoms and stuff. There was something called the Ziyad the kingdom and there were a few other of these, they call them different kingdoms. Uh, but yeah. Okay. okay. Um, right. who, was, who was known as the uh, Lion of Ain Jalut? Uh, the Lion of Ain Jalut is, they, they call him uh, Saifuddin Qutuz. Saifuddin Qutuz, he was known as the line of Ain Jalut. So are they asking, is it Baybar or is it Qutuz? Uh, <laughs> they say it was, it, was, it was Qutuz. He was the one who was leading the battle. Uh, where, where does uh, Ibn Taymiyyah come, come in? Okay, Ibn Taymiyyah comes in because later on what happened is the, uh, the Mongols, some of them, who had, they, they, they had said they had accepted Islam, some of them apostated, so to speak. And they started fighting against the Muslims again. Started fighting against the Muslims again. So the Muslims, once again, had to defend themselves against the Mongols. So Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he comes, much, he comes a bit later, actually, after all of this. They had to fight the Mongols again. Because some of the Mongols who were thought to be Muslim, they actually decided again that they turned against the Muslims and they started fighting Muslims. 
Uh, so, so the Muslims had to defend themselves again. So Ibn Taymiyyah was involved in that. And Ibn Taymiyyah actually fought in the, fought in the, that, that, the war. Another, another question. Why did they pay Arabic uh, there in the last Muslim power? Good question. Because, okay, can you repeat the question? okay, the question is, why were they praying? Uh, oh Allah, save us. Say, oh Allah, save us because we are, it's as if we're going to be the last, the last Muslims uh, here. If you look at geographically, if you look at what's, what's happening here, the Mongols have come from the Far East and they swept through Khorasan, uh, you know, I, mean, I keep saying Khorasan, maybe I should say, you know, modern day Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Afghanistan Kazakhstan, uh, Turkmenistan, all these places, Iraq, all of Iraq has fallen, uh, Iran, of course, uh, uh, Asham, Bilad Asham is very important, Syria, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, all these places, very important. They swept through all of this. And at the end of that, the only thing now standing in their way from wiping out all the rest of the Muslims is basically Egypt. Because behind Egypt, what was behind Egypt? There's, you know, Libya and all these places. In those places, there wasn't really any established power as such. There were just different tribes. There were just some different tribes there. And also, Spain, the kingdom of Spain. You know, the Muslims were in Spain. It's amazing. The Muslims, as I said, in the Umayyad time, they went to Spain and they conquered Spain and Portugal and all that. They even went even further. They, went, they were within 30 kilometers of modern day Paris. In that time, in the Umayyad time, they were within 30 kilometers of modern day Paris. And that lasted for 700 years. 700 years, the Muslims were in Spain and Portugal. That part at this point was also collapsing. So now there's just Egypt. Behind that, there's, you know, Libya and uh, Algeria, Tunisia, all of this, but there's no established power there. And then on the other side in Europe, there's Spain, but that's also now starting to fall. So if they get past Egypt, they're going to take Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, all these parts. And then the other part in Spain will seem like it's going to fall anyway. So then what's left? Just Makkah and Medina. But there's no, there's no army there, no power there. So there's basically, the, maybe the Muslims, will, so, if, so at any point in time at that point, the Muslims could, sorry, the Mongols could wipe them out. Mongols could get rid of the, get rid of the Muslims in Makkah and Medina because they're just, they're just civilians, they're just people, there's no, no real power there. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll send you the Kahoot pin. I send you the Kahoot pin. Anyone put on there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, everyone here, the pin is, uh, if, if, if anyone's got kahoot.it, go to kahoot.it. <clears throat> and then you put in uh, 425, oh, sorry. Yeah, Four, sorry, 425 uh, 5707. 425-5707.
Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That, that was what I was just thinking. Yeah, we're we'll trying to put it on here. Yeah. yeah, I've shared the screen on there, but um, <clears throat> I need to share it for everyone here. Uh, there is 30 second time limit. Okay, can what can you see now? Oh there. You guys can see me, right? Can you can you still see it? If you go to your, I said that Yahoo, YouTube. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, shall we start? Uh, everyone's. Yeah. Okay, Bismillah, let's start. Everyone seems to have joined. Okay, 20 players, Bismillah. I mentioned this right at the beginning, I think, <clears throat> in my long introduction. Oh, okay, hold on. Once, what, how long is it today? Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Okay, let me. Well, I can, <coughs> I can change them out one minute. Hmm? Is it? I thought that they were shorter. Okay. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Because only the people here can do it, others can do it. Okay. Um, should I do that? Okay, let's stop. Let's um, one moment. Uh, let me let me restart. Everyone <coughs> online was, was uh, because they didn't have enough time. 
Can you just change it? Yeah, I'll just change it to a minute. Oh, I think because maybe because the internet's very slow now. Hmm? Seems like the internet's very slow now. Okay, hold on a second, sorry. Um, okay, I'll just make the time limit two minutes on all of them. That should be enough, right? Making the time limit on all of them two minutes. So everyone will have plenty of time. Yeah, it's loading game pen. Uh, yeah, sharing screen now. Okay, there should be no more time now. The same pin and no, the pin is here, you can, you can see it. Huh? They can see it, a shed at the top. Hmm? It's up there. Okay, I'm just trying to, everyone can see it now, yeah? Okay, great, let's start.
Did you forget? <laughs> yes. How many minutes? How many seconds gone? 30, that's then another 90 seconds. Wow. 14 people got it right, mashallah. Very good. Okay, everyone's answered now, I think. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just so, just so, yeah, just remind everyone. Qutayb ibn Muslim was went to sort of northwest, northeast, northeast. So all the, all the, um, everything above uh, Iran. And Muhammad ibn al Qasim went north, sorry, went southeast to India and modern day Pakistan. And Uqba ibn Nafi' went uh, west to, you know, uh, Shamal Africa, you know, um, Libya, um, Algeria, and all of this. Tariq ibn Ziyad went actually to Europe, to uh, Spain and Portugal. Okay. Yeah, because what everyone else says, 30 second today. How many seconds? 65, We've got all 16 answers. No, actually, I think there, there would be one more, otherwise it would, it would finish. Okay, there we go. Okay, so mashallah, 11 people got it right. Two people thought he was supporting the oppression. Two, two people thought he was a mayor himself. Okay. <laughs> Good. Inshallah. Hmm? Yeah, it's on the next one. Oops, one of them just says they. Okay. <laughs> Not sure what happened to that option. I think some error over there. Yeah, so everyone seems to have got it. Mamluks were slaves, so it was a bit unusual for ruling. Okay. MashaAllah, who's MF? Oh dear. You guys have you guys have an advantage, of course. Hopefully, you understand that because you're all sitting here, so no lag. You're helping them. <laughs> the team, okay. Mashallah.
I think whoever MF is, I'm going to remove them from the Kahoot. I'm going to remove MF from the Kahoot. Uh, could, but uh, just because, yeah. Automatically. Yeah, when everyone's finished, it automatically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe there's one person left who's not answered. Okay, all of the above. Yeah. So everyone, everyone was right. To be honest, everyone was right. The only thing is, uh, the complete answer was number number four. It's all four of them. So all three of them. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> right on. It's moved on. Yes. Yeah. No, I was still waiting for one person. I was still waiting for one person. Okay, let's press skip. Let's press skip. I think there's still one more that has an answer. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, good. Everyone got that right. Uh, here's a difficult one. Who can remember this? <clears throat> Mary Ellen. Can't remember. Can't remember this. Okay, everyone's answered. Uh, so, oh yes, I, mean, I, 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 I guess, I guess a few people might have googled that. <laughs> anyway, okay. Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay, so Okay. Most of you got that. Some said Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, yeah, so I said Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah was uh, involved in this, but later on, when the Mongols came again to attack again. Okay. So, Okay, yeah, so <clears throat> Hulagu's brother, who was the emperor, he died. Uh, so Hulagu had to return to the capital and he took with him most of the army. So Muslims only had to fight a lot less people. Good, okay, last one. This is a bit of a difficult one. I don't know who, if anyone, if anyone caught it. Very difficult one. 
because they all had different titles. I said all of them in passing. I think I said this one is Saif al-Din, this one is Rukm-Din, this one is Fakhr al-Din, this one is Faris al-Din, this one is Mu'iz al-Din. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't said to give more time to the back. So. <coughs> okay, yeah, people. Okay, mashallah. So some, most people, yeah. So Ruknuddin, Ruknuddin was uh, Baybars and Saifuddin was Qutus. So uh, Saif means, you know, Saif means sword. So Saifuddin. Like, you know, Saifullah, uh, Khalid, ibn Al-Wid, Khalid ibn Al-Walid was uh, called Saifullah. So Rukn, uh, this uh, Qutus is called Saifuddin. Rukn, Rukn means pillar. Rukn means pillar. So, you know what, uh, something something relies on. So uh, Bibars called himself Rukn, Rukn al-Din, the pillar of the... You know, okay, good, great. So let's see who won. Yeah, nobody who's actually present is allowed to win. So... Okay, so Ali G1, whoever that is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> MF, MF can't win because MF is sitting here with no lag, so they have an advantage. One is up, Abdul Latif and Iman. Okay, well done everyone, mashallah. Congratulations to... I don't know who Ali G is. Maybe. Okay, might be him. Okay, well done everyone, mashallah. Congratulations. Apologies for that. Slightly late start, and also sorry we've gone on a bit longer than expected. I think because of the Kahoot, technical issues, you know, had to get the lag and everything sorted. So, apologies for that. I had to give two minutes for each question. Anyway, Jazakallah khair everyone for attending. Um, hope you enjoyed it, and see you all next time. Slide back out. Okay. So screenshot as well, okay?